Hello and welcome to this mini masterclass. Delighted to welcome back Kirsty McNeil, who uh, formerly worked as a special advisor at Number 10 and is now Executive Director for Policy, Advocacy and Campaigns at Save the Children. So thanks very much for joining us, Kirsty. And today we're asking you, what makes a brilliant lobbying meeting? So I think there's three things to consider before you go in to get yourself in the right headspace. The first is politicians are very political. Secondly, they trade for a living. And thirdly, we all have different roles and campaigners make things possible, but politicians make things happen. Okay, um, so you said politicians are very political, that sounds obvious, what do, you, what do you really mean? So I mean a few ways in which they're different to other people that you might interact with. So first of all, they are animated by political ideas and political values and they have a framework for making decisions that's not like other actors in a policy system and they've been committed to them often for their whole lives. So you need to think about how they think about policies and ideas, through what prism are they making decisions. But they also, unlike other actors in the policy system, have enemies. So they've joined one team and that team fights against another team. So they live with 24 seven other people who want their jobs, trying to take their jobs away from them, willing them to fail. And also they deal with a media that gives them really intensive scrutiny of all their ideas. So they make decisions on the basis of values that might not be present in the rest of the system, but they also analyse risk more ferociously than other bits of the system because they have people waiting all the time to take their jobs from them. Very interesting. And you said they also trade. What do you mean by that? So, I mean, if you're lucky enough to live in a democracy, one of the brilliant things about living in a well-functioning state is no one has all the power. So you always have things that you need. It doesn't matter how powerful you are as a politician. You still need things from other people. So they are constantly forming alliances, sharing information, trying to work out what coalition could get behind a cause that they support. So whilst they may have the ability to pass budgets or laws, you have things that they value. So you have access to information based on the programmes or services that you run. You have access to intelligence about what other people are thinking that they may have said to you that they wouldn't say to that decision maker's face. You could give them a venue to do a big speech. You could give them an endorsement or a quote that they could use in Parliament to see why their policy idea is good. They value all these things. But so they're constantly looking to work out how can you serve each other. It's not quite as straightforward as you're a supplicant and they have all the power. In a democracy, we all have power and that's one of the brilliant things about it. Great, and you said we should stick to our roles. So uh, what did you mean by that? So what I mean is, crucially, campaigners and activists are not very good at acknowledging that it's our job to create the conditions for success. So we create a public opinion climate or a set of evidence that makes it more likely that something will happen. But in the end, the person whose job it is, the person who has a mandate and responsibility to make something happen, is an elected politician. And we're often not very good at acknowledging the authenticity of their mandate and acknowledging that they face constraints that we don't have because they have to make sure that lots of different constituencies are kept happy. And crucially, we're not very good at saying thank you. In the end, if they choose to spend public money or pass a law that affects everybody, then they've done that because we've persuaded them. But it's their jobs that are on the line, they're accountable for it. So we should say thanks very much for spending their political capital in the interests of the public interest that we represent. Well, thank you, Kirsty. Um, and uh, as you know, uh, this is your second time uh, with us and we're uh, asking everyone to recommend either a piece of reading or listening or watching. So you get a second chance. What's your second item? So in service of the first lesson that I had about realising that politicians are animated by political ideas. I would really recommend this book, which is called Political Philosophy, A Beginner's Guide for Students and Politicians by Adam Swift, who is a political philosophy professor. And in it, he goes through all the main ideas that you're talked about in politics, but you don't often think about. So when you say you believe in justice or freedom or equality, what do you mean? And what do they mean? So if you want to understand why some people end up on the right to centre and why some people end up on the left to centre, it's not because we're good or bad people, it's because we value different of these concepts more or less highly. So this is a really good introductory guide to some of the key hardware of political philosophy. Great stuff. Well, thank you very much, Kirsty. Brilliant insights as ever from Kirsty McNeil, poacher turned gamekeeper. And um, if you uh, enjoyed listening to this, please do tweet and 
email us any of your questions uh, and please share the video. Thank you very much.